Hi, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Scott uh, for our AT today. Scott spent his childhood days exploring wild areas near his home in Houston. He developed an interest in animal behavior, which led him to study biochemistry in college. Um, and then he went on to graduate school. He also worked at maintaining fish, growing plants, and collecting marine inverte invertebrates. He spent his weekends looking for birds and other wildlife along the coast and in the piney woods of Texas. Um, Scott is a self-taught professional photographer who has traveled the world on photo adventures, and he leads our chapter's digital media photo group. Um, he also has a lot of iNaturalist street cred. Um, he is number one in Galveston County with over 11,000 observations. Um, he is number four in observations in the greater Houston area, which is the six county area that comprises our area for the City Nature Challenge. He was number five in the number of observations in the Houston Galveston City Nature Challenge last year. He was number three in the total number of identifications for the City Nat Nature Challenge in 2021. And I believe that was for the entire City Nature Challenge. But Scott can correct me if I'm wrong on that one. Um, and the year before in 2020 in our pandemic year, he was number 13 in total number of observations for the whole City Nature Challenge. And he was number one in the total number of identifications for the City Nature Challenge. So as you can see, he's obviously the right person to get us ready for to use iNaturalist for this year's City Nature Challenge. And I hand it over to Scott. Let's go ahead and get started here. Um, I want to go ahead and welcome everybody to the AT. Um, City Nature Challenge and iNaturalist are kind of one of my uh, big sort of major hobbies these days because I see a lot of a lot of things can be done with it, and I'm seeing more and more people utilize it for a lot of different things. I'll give you an introduction to, to the application iNaturalist and the big database and all that. And I'm going to also give you a little presentation on how to use iNaturalist because that's the precursor to participating in the City Nature Challenge. And we'll talk about those things. And so here's the agenda. I'm going to go, I'm going to talk about what iNaturalist is, why I use it. Because it's always, I always think it's always kind of nice to know the biases of the speaker. So you'll hear what some of my biases are and why I started doing it. And I'll talk a little about why you should use it as well. Uh, and and in, then inevitably, people will want to know and com compare it to eBird because, well, maybe it's because I know a lot of birders and that I get that question a lot. <clears throat> and then I'll talk a little about how to use an iNaturalist using a smartphone, and I'll actually make an observation live. Even though it's in my office, I did go outside and collected a specimen. Um, so, and then I'll talk about doing it with a computer. And then I'll why use it and, and what is the city nature challenge and why are we kind of why are we always getting excited about that every year and is and I might I'll briefly talk about what kind of information that, that I can you can use and I naturalist if we have time. Um, and maybe that's actually maybe a, another AT for the future that we could go ahead and talk about sort of using the database to get information if you want to find things and learn things and stuff like that. So what is iNaturalist? Well, iNaturalist is, is actually kind of a social media. It's a social media, and it's basically a community of over 750,000 scientists and naturalists, and naturalists are any, you know, this is not necessarily professionally trained. It's a lot of, I've run into and met a lot, a huge number of uh, private individuals that are just or passionate about like moths or fungus or something like that. And I've run across them and learned things from them. But it's it allows people to record and share your observations of nature. And as a byproduct, it creates research quality data for scientists working at universities, looking at things. There's a whole bunch of papers and things like that people have been using iNaturalist for. And there's a couple of examples. And I don't, I don't know if I remember putting it into the presentation today. So why do I use iNaturalist? Well, I used eBird for many, many years and I recorded all my bird observations. You know, birders like to do things, they keep track of their birds. And you know, I never really paid close attention to 
had I seen a bird in what county and all that. And actually eBird being in a database with a location, you it actually allows, it'll do a lot of parsing data for you. And you can know, then you can start looking at how many birds you saw in individual counties and things like that. But I kept track of them because I wanted to know, as a photographer, I wanted to know when did birds usually start showing up and when did they leave to kind of plan photo trips. It's kind of the original way I got into eBird. Now it's just, I want to keep track of what I've seen. But it only recorded birds. so. You know, and I, I look at and I photograph birds and plants, basically any natural thing. So I, I was kind of at a loss. I liked the database and it tracked things for me, but it didn't give me quite enough. And so I was looking for uh, an alternative. You know, I had trouble keeping track of things because I, I was writing them in a notebook. And if you're used to using databases and things like that, Notebooks are great to record information in, but it is hard to find things in notebooks. I mean, I had a stack and I, I meant to pull it out, but I did some do some remodeling and actually have all those notebooks stored away right now. And I can't couldn't can't shoot this big stack of little notebooks that I have of observations. But I just kept looking for something. Because, you know, notebooks are not readily searchable. And then I was also having problems correlating photos with observations. I'd remember, oh yeah, I've seen a certain bird and I have a photograph of it. And maybe I didn't put it in the metadata and, and, and wasn't able to track it that way. But if I go ahead and make all these observations in iNaturalist, I can actually find these things. And frequently, I'll admit I was too lazy or too involved into something to take any notes. And then afterwards I realized I didn't take any notes. And for example, what kind of got me hooked on iNaturalist, I'd saw the application. I hadn't really made any observations. I was at High Island I, and I took it, I was taking pictures of the rookery there. And there was a dragonfly that landed in front of me. I didn't know what it was at the time. And I snapped a picture of it with my phone. And well, I thought about this, I, I had this iNaturalist app. So, it was like the fourth or fifth observation I ever made. And I observed this uh, dragonfly. And after, um, after I was photographing, I stopped, looked at my phone, I went back to the app, and I realized that that observation had become research grade. I didn't know what research grade meant at the time, and I'll be defining that later. But there was a, a guy that became a friend that was a photographer that I knew very well, Greg Lasley. Identified it, told me it was a tenoral. Um, dragonfly. I didn't know what that meant. I had to look that up, but it was, you know, a, a newly emerged dragonfly. And it was like, wow, you know, someone like Greg Lasley is paying attention to this. So I started paying a little bit more attention to it. I got to know Greg personally. I only knew him through his photographs before that. <clears throat> and so I, I realized it was an easy way to record observations of things that I saw. And then I also was realizing that a lot of times I'd go outdoors and I go out to take photographs, but the weather was terrible. The light wasn't any good. And I just didn't take the pictures because there was no use for them. And so I started realizing that, you know, looking at pictures on iNaturalist, you know, there are a few people that always put in high quality photographs. I mean, Greg Lasley always had really nice photographs. He didn't put the mediocre photographs in, um, but I think he never took bad photographs. But um, I started realizing that I could go out even in bad weather and make observations that potentially were useful. So that kind of got hooked. And I found out there, you know, I found out that, you know, that could take a mini time making, I could actually spend, I actually realized I was spending more time outdoors, seeing more things, I learned more. And, and, and I realized early on, they would allow me to sort the data that I gather because I could look up um, is, in actress, it's very easy to find out all your bird observations or all your plant observations. If you want to get lower, you can actually say, you know, all your observations of a particular bird or a particular plant, even down to the species level. It, whatever you needed to do, you could find that information. If you wanted to find an example of, you know, of some group of some family of plants, for example, you could do that. And so I kind of got hooked on it and started taking lots of pictures and everything I did, I put in. <clears throat> but then, you know, as soon as you start doing it, you know, Greg Lasley pushed me to start doing things in Odonta Central because he helped um, the Abbott, uh, the Abbott set up this website. He, he, he was a moderator and all that. 
And I started making dragonfly observations there. And it was kind of interesting because these, some of these smaller special, especially databases like Odonta Central, I made some of the original, the only, the first observations of several dragonflies and damselflies in Galveston County. It was kind of cool that I was the first one in that county to document it. And that's what Odonta Central wants to do is they want to document the dis distribution down to at least like the, the at the, at least the county level. But then there were also other, there's other kind of online databases like Bug Guide. And Bug Guide, I know that a lot of people here make comments about bugs. To me, bugs are all arthropods or bugs, and some insects are also, so all insects are bugs in that regard. I know that other people hear other things, but you know, the bug guide has all the arthropods in it. You can, you know, all insects, all this stuff. And it's, it's kind of an interesting website. It's a little hard to move around in. I've used it a little bit. I find it very unfriendly to use, even though I've met a number of different people from bug guide that have helped me out. And I've learned a lot of things from them. I don't really recommend that website to people unless they really want to get into insects, because you really have to know insect nomenclature and the families, subfamilies and all that sort of stuff. And I generally don't know that. I kind of want to find something and I've used the, the I, you can actually get stuff ID'd, but a lot of those guys are not very friendly and helpful at times, but sometimes they are. But eButterfly is another website that just basically creates, you can create lists of butterflies. But most of these like Odonta Central, Bug Guide, and eButterfly, they really want you to have a photograph of the animal. While eBird, it's just a, a record. And a lot of people would wish that some of these databases were more like eBird. So iNaturalist is a little different kind of a database. And it's more like a classic natural history museum. And, uh, I, I, you know, having been in, that, in the academic world as well as the industrial world, I'm, I'm familiar with how museums work. It allows you to go, the lazy museums allow you to go in and you can see like a, a specimen of an animal and it'll have like the locate the locality and the date the animal was, the animal or the plant was collected. And that's what iNaturalist does. Um, you know, it collects that just it's sort of like a voucher. It's like this thing was here at this time. While eBird is a little different, it gathers an effort component as well as a distance component to be able to get a little bit more information. They can use that information to get population size and population trends. While applications like Odonta Central, eBird, uh, and iNaturalist, you really can't get that kind of information, you can get distribution information, and we really can't get size or trend information. You can, might could get inf information about trends, but you, it's making, you have to make a lot of assumptions. So basically, iNaturalist indicates that an organism was at this place at this time on this date. And that's all it really indicates. And that's kind of, and that can be very valuable in science, knowing that that specimen was there, particularly if there's a photograph of it, you can find out information about it. And I will show you that how the photographs were used in a slide, in, slide coming up. So it's a lot like a museum collection. So why do I, why should you use it? Because it can track what you've seen, where you've seen it, and, and when you saw it. And that information for a lot of us, for example, we go to these different, we, we volunteer and do work at all different, different locations and people managing those properties can, if we gather enough information, those properties, they can use that information saying, hey, we have people here and they've seen this huge number of species and they actually have data to support that. They can actually say that, yes, we've actually seen this, we know these things are here. And that can be a real nice tool. If you ever get a chance at a state meeting to hear Sam Kieschnick speak about it, he's a big, he's a bigger proponent of iNaturalist than I am. And he speaks at all the state meetings and he uses it on a regular basis. And he's gotten a lot of other managers of properties to use it. And they've all noticed that by having that data, 
they're able to really make a case for what their volunteers are doing, improving habitat and things like that. So there's a lot of reasons to do it. And being familiar with it, I think, is, is a great thing that way. And you can contribute to science. I mean, there are papers uh, just recently, Andrew uh, Meads is a guy that I met through uh, iNaturalist. He's really, he's an entomologist by training. He's got a master's degree in, in entomology. He is really, really into the, the, the bug group of insects. He's really into stink bugs in particular. And he now works in a forensic entomology lab at uh, Arizona State University. And they just published a paper about a new stink bug that's coming in from California into Arizona. That's an Asian, that's an Asian uh, stink bug. And he's, they've been able to document how it's flown and basically how it's moved into Arizona. And that is actually a very prominent part of that paper that they just published just this last week. He posted it on Facebook, I think, uh, yesterday. And uh, so you can contribute to science. I mean, there's, I'll show you an example, a little, little bit coming up here of some things that have done. And you can help others see and find things. I mean, um, it was interesting. I was talking to a, a colleague that lives in the Bay Area, in San Francisco Bay Area. And they, they sent me a picture of a great blue heron. And they said, oh, and I, I told them what it was and they got all excited about it. They, they'd never seen one. That's a rare bird for the area. And I went to the iNaturalist and found out there was like several thousand observations in the Bay Area of, of that bird, I think. And it's like, well, you know, I think he, probably now that you've seen it, you'll see it a little bit more often. But I find that if you see it, identify it, take a picture of it, you're more apt to remember what it is. Um, I think it was Baron Richter made a talk, talk to the Master Naturalist class after right after mine or the second one after my class and made a comment that if it has a name, people are more apt to remember it. And I naturalists, I'll show you as a way to get a name for things and that can help people be more aware. And you can possibly get others in touch with nature. I mean, that's one of the charters we have is we want, we want people to know a little bit about nature, appreciate a little bit more. And this is maybe a nice little tool for that. Um, making a slightly little shift here, and it kind of orients towards sort of the bias as the chapter. You know, a lot of people like to teach young people about, about nature and get them involved, right? Because we, if we get the young people involved and can, caring about nature, we can actually maybe continue the work and have things progress. And, you know, there's a group of people that feel there's this thing called, they call it nature deficit disorder. That's idea that human beings, particularly children, are spending less time outdoors. And this is resulting in a lot of behavioral problems. There's a whole group of people think this is very, very important. Other people think the data is a little bit too soft. But it's going on with that principle is it's not meant to be a medical diagnosis, but maybe it's a little warning that people are alienating themselves from the natural world. And I think we kind of want to reverse that kind of thought and make people appreciate nature. And a lot of us, you know, spend, try to be in nature as often as possible. But he also points out in his, this loop points out in his books that children have, are, are attracted to electronic devices. And I would say that master naturalists are as well, because how often do, do we see people walking around with these phones in front of them taking pictures, right? It can be, an, it can be a connection. It's a great uh, data collecting tool, but children love it because it's kind of like playing a game. <clears throat> so technology, we can think of technology as a hook. Children can relate to technology. I mean, the current joke is, you know, if, if you're older and you need some tech support, you go to your grandchildren to get tech support on your phone or your computer, right? You know, children grow up with the technology. It's natural to them, right? And they, they can even enjoy technology. Um, I mean, I see undergraduates in laboratories and, and they have phones in front of them whenever they're not doing an experiment. It's amazing. I never really realized how much they use their phones. And they take pictures of everything, including their experiments. It's kind of interesting. Um, but so iNaturalist is an app on smartphones. In fact, 98% of all the promotion you ever see 
about iNaturalist will be kind of pushing people to use their phones to use iNaturalist. And I'm using it more and more and more. Most of my plant observations, I use, I use a phone, but not all of them. Uh, I use the phone a lot and because it, it winds up being kind of convenient because it does a lot of things for you. So, you know, with children liking technology and having an app that tells them a little bit about nature and lets them know what things are and gives different things a name, maybe it can connect children to nature and making nature observations and appreciating nature even more. So I think that if, you know, whenever we have these outreach events, if you have children around, you might want to try to promote them, you know, get use iNaturals enough that you feel comfortable kind of showing children how to use it. Uh, I think they'll pick it up pretty quickly, uh, maybe quicker than all of us learned it, but they can pick it up pretty quickly and easily. Okay, and the citizen and science aspect of this, you know, and I made reference to it a little bit earlier that a lot of habitat managers use the data collected in their management strategy. I know Aaron Tomlin at Texas City Prairie Preserve is using the project there to help justify and work on projects. He's, he uses some of that information to sell some of his ideas and projects that he wants TNC to fund and approve for him to work on. So, I mean, here's an example. I know that uh, Sam Chiesnick does it, and I know a lot of other managers probably do this as well. So make observations in a lot of these places. <clears throat> here's a little bit, you know, here's a little something in, you know, the City Nature Challenge in 2018 documented 598 endangered species living within generally what is referred to as an urban area. So like, uh, I forget there was close to a hundred endangered species identified in the Houston Galveston area in 2018 on the city nature challenge. And we can actually demonstrate that, Hey, even the urban areas, we actually maybe need, we need to start thinking about protecting them because there's wildlife in the city. And I like the idea of making people aware of it, you know, learning to live with these things, but uh, in 2020, over 1,300 endangered species were documented during the City Nature Challenge. And think about it, that's a four-day period of time when people go out and look for these things. Um, and it's kind of interesting to see that. And we can, and um, people like Jaime Gonzalez are using this kind of information in their day-to-day -day job of promoting conservation and things like that in the area. He uses this kind of information all the time. And I'll show you some of the data that he really gets excited about towards the end of the presentation. And iNaturalist was used in 114 publications in 2018. I have not been able, I, was, I, I quickly looked around the last couple of evenings and I wasn't able to find out how many publications they were used since then. But in, you know, in 2018, 114 publications used data from iNaturalist. And it's pretty easy to pull information out and you can, get, you can actually get data overload almost from looking at through iNaturalist. Why use it? Well, there's another reason. You know, some of us wind up getting stuck working in our offices for a while. You know, you might have days of, you know, still doing work. And what I've been known to do is during the day is just to go in and go in and look in, and maybe I can show it live, but you can look at it and see what people are seeing and posting, you know, look at your, your dashboard of anybody you follow and you can see what people are seeing. So you can actually see the birds that people are seeing and actually, you, you know, these are pictures of the birds they actually saw in that area. You know, you can contribute to citizen science and I think it's kind of nice, to both, both aspects are pretty important. And, you know, in 2018, there was an article published where the, 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 the graduate student that was looking realized that these blue dasher dragonflies all had different amounts of color on their wings. And he, he realized by pulling out the observations and putting on the map and showing the color distribution, that there was a correlation between the coloration of the wings and the temperature in the area. So it was kind of, he, he, he had an idea of something, noticed, made the observation and then pulled the data out 
and looked at all the photographs and just put them on a map and realized that, hey, the temperature has an effect on this color. It was able to sort of show a correlation between the coloration of, of the dragonfly wings and the temperature in an area. So it's kind of interesting. You never know. I think this is an interesting one in that you never know what some scientist might run across and what data he might need. So just take, if you take really good, you know, best quality photos as you can that can identify a specimen, you never know what they might find. And, and Scott, we do have a question for you. Sure. Uh, Mike Pettit wants to know if you can take pictures concurrently with a camera, be added to a cell phone pictures later for an observation. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, you can revise those and add them back and add them in. There's, you can do, do it either way. And you can do it just from a camera, or just, just from a phone, or you can use both. Okay. Okay, let's talk about using iNaturalist. Well, if you go to the website, iNaturalist.org, this is the page. I think this is what the page still looks like when you go to it the first time. And it shows you, it says connect with nature. You can sign up and you can click on this box right here. But uh, it had, tells you how it all works here. You record your observations and notice that they're promoting a cell phone. Uh, I guess I guess these days it's considered that everybody has cell phones. And uh, then you go ahead and you make an observation of like this little caterpillar here and you can share it. And actually there's been every, it doesn't happen at a, a huge frequency, but a number of my observations and other people's observations, you might have 40, 50, 60 people comment and make comments and ask questions. Uh, Greg Lasley and a number of other people, a number of the bird people have spent a lot, spent, spent a lot of time giving hints on to bird ID, particularly if you misidentify a bird, they'll say, hey, you know, did you notice this characteristic or that characteristic, or they find that this characteristic is really important. Um, you can actually learn a lot, particularly if there's these challenging IDs, you're more apt to get discussion. Um, and a key here, I will also point out that there are people coming through making identifications. If you want identifications, you need to kind of help people out and doing as much of the ID as you possibly can. Um, because you, you can make an observation and put it as an unknown. And if you put it in as an unknown, the likelihood that somebody will look at it and comment on it, if it's not city nature challenge time, is pretty low. But if you go ahead and say it's an insect or it's a plant, a lot of the people that do plant ID will go ahead and every now and then go ahead and search things labeled plant and be able to identify them. Um, so keep in mind, the identifier's job on iNaturalist is very difficult. It can be a lot of very time consuming and, and help these guys out because they're the guys that really help us understand. They help a lot of us learn how to identify things better and maybe observe things in our yards. So this discussion part, I think, is kind of is kind of a nice feature of iNaturalist. Let's go through it again. That's a little bit more detail. Um, you're going to need you need to make an iNaturalist account. And a couple of years ago, we did an event during City Nature Challenge at Armin Bio, and it was it was Migratory Bird Day or something. I don't remember exactly what the event was, but that day, I actually convinced a, about twenty or thirty people that had their phones to actually go ahead and you know, if they have Android phones, you know they most likely have a Gmail address, and if you have a Gmail address, it's only a couple of clicks, and you can you can get an iNaturalist account very quickly. And I had several people do that right in front of me and they, were, they documented the, the banded water snake or the lizard's tail. Um, they were right in, right in that area that I was talking about this. So you need to set up an account and you can put all your personal observations in it. Um, and there are some accounts that are set up to be sort of generic. I know that EIH has a number of accounts set up for all, for their individual iPads. You can set up accounts in a, much, a number of different ways. But you start off by, well, you can lo locate it. If you're using a phone, it's really easy. You just make sure the location uh, information is there. You can still obscure the ID. 
and I will post in the chat later uh, a link to a video that I made that actually talks about exactly how to do these things using an iPhone. And Android is very similar. Uh, but if you need if you need to obscure it, a lot of people want to obscure observations, particularly if you make it in your backyard. A lot of people don't want people to know where their backyard is. I can understand that. But so, but you can make it public, and if you obscure it, um, people if you put it into a project, the leaders of the project, so researchers can potentially see it, but the general public can't. Uh, you figure out what you saw, and and I. Here, I can't emphasize this any great any any more. You know what you saw. Try to group it into a group of organisms. You know, if it's a butter, let's say you see a, a monarch butterfly, but you don't know that it's a monarch butterfly, but you know it's a butterfly. Go ahead and label it butterfly, and the community can come in and help. And another thing about this, you know, a lot of people and a lot of us have talked about it that other people can come in and identify your stuff. I had a um, crab identified four days ago that I recorded six years ago. So sometimes it takes a while for an expert to run across it and to come and identify it, particularly when it's a challenging organism. If it's a charismatic organism, you know, I can tell you if it's a bird in Texas, if if you go more than a couple of days without someone commenting on it, it must be that the photograph they was, wasn't good enough for the people to determine what it was. Um, because some of the charismatic organisms, people are on really quick. A lot of the mammals in Texas, I've noticed get identified very quickly. I made an observation of a possum at Russ Pittman Park a few weeks ago. And by the time before I even left the park, it had become a research grade observation. We'll talk about that, what that means a little bit later. But then you need to record when you saw it. So, and if you're using a phone and it automatically records that for you, if you're in a, using a camera, I recommend making sure that your camera has your digit. And I'm assuming everybody's using a digital camera these days. There's very few people using film. Uh, but if you're using digital camera, you can put the date and time. And every time there's a time change, remember you need to change it. Uh, some cameras allow you to just to click a box that's uh, daylight savings time or not daylight savings time, but um, be sure to try to get that accurate. And then evidence of what you saw. And that can be from a photo or sound. Um, it was kind of fun last year was the first time I ever tried to use the sound recording because it actually became one step easier on iNaturalist last year. But I was at TCPP the first morning of City Nature Challenge. I walked down a path, I heard a common yellow throat and I said, you know, there's this sound thing and this bird is very speaking very, is, is, is very loud. Maybe I can record it. And I recorded it and put it in and it got identified it got the, the identification got agreed upon like the next day it was kind of it was kind of nice so you can actually record sounds so go ahead and try to record sounds and you can and you'll see whenever i show you the the app live you will show you where that button is and it's just, the button is about the same place in android too i think so but you know these are the key things Using the iPhone app. Well, instead of using this, going through this, I'm going to stop the share and I'm going to start a different share here. Ah, here it is. Okay, so iNaturalist as get it started here it's a little green bird what i have here is uh you probably can't see my finger here but at the bottom part of the panel that'd be kind of nice if i could move my you see in the bottom part here there's explore which if you hit explore button it'll show you where you are and any observations you might make in the area and see if you go ahead and start blowing it up you can see i think you can figure out where i live i've made a few observations around the house and out, out here, actually there should be a bunch of them right along the shoreline. Um, 
iPhone GPS coordinates aren't, they aren't necessarily uh, particularly accurate. Look at the little blue indication here out in the middle of the, uh, the lake. But you see all these little red, red and blue markers are different where different observations have been made. So if you're some location, you can actually go to this explore button and explore and see what other people have seen in the area. You can scroll around and see what people have seen. Let's see, let's go over quickly over here. Let's see. Oh, well, I can't see any real close here, but you can find observations in different places. Okay, activity, you can see what you've been doing, you know, here, um, IDs and different things that I've done. And, you know, you can see that like people have identified some of this orange poor fungus that I saw a couple of years ago. Um, me, you can have your listing of observations. You see the last observation I made was banded water snake, and that was at Armin just not too long ago. And if you're a member of several projects, we'll talk about projects a little bit later, but you can find projects you're members of here. But the most important one to know about is this observe button in the middle. And if you notice cross crossed here, you can make one with no photo. You notice this little circle with a camera on it is a camera. The next one over is photo library. So if you've taken a picture, a couple of pictures with your phone and you didn't want to be using the app, um, you can go ahead and pull something out of your, your, your photo library. But the new one that came in about this time last year is record sound. So you can actually hit that button and it'll record sound. You just hit it and it'll start recording and you hit it again and it'll stop recording and it'll make an observation for you. But let's go ahead and make an observation. I uh, went outdoors, went outside and uh, looked for, I have a lot of plants and pots, none of them were blooming. So I cut a bloom off to go ahead and make an observation. So I have the camera starting up here. You have my desk here and you see I have a stem from a plant and let's go ahead and what I do, particularly with plants, a lot of times if you have your hand in the picture, you notice how quickly the, the focus snapped in place. And there we have a nice picture. And you see at the very bottom, it has retake and use photo. Just go ahead and you click use photo. And now you have an observation. What I recommend doing, particularly with plants, is to make a second or third observation, a little bit more detail. A lot of the plant people will want to know other more, you know, more detail about the plant. And what I would do here is I would go ahead and you see the little box at the top here, just below the cancel button. Click on that little box with a plus and it'll activate the camera again. You click camera. And then what I do would go down to the leaf here, take another picture and use photo. Okay, now you see after this situation, you see that you, you see the top, you see that there's two photos here. There's a little box with a question mark. What did you see? Go ahead and touch that. And what it'll do is it, they, it uses artificial intelligence to uh, identify things. And this is Penston and Tuis. They call it sharp, sheetal, sharp, sharp sepal beard tongue. We call it Gulf Coast Penstemon as well. So just, you just touch on that. And I knew that one's right. So you see it, it put that ID there. You know, excuse me, a little bit further down. It does the date then the time. So we know it's, you know, April, 4, April 13th at, at 2.44 PM. So that means I got 15 more minutes. And it, the location is Glacier Avenue in Texas City. That's where I live. Geo privacy. Now, for example, if you wanted to keep it private, you can, you can click obscured, which means it'll be blurred that people that scientists could potentially and project leaders can possibly see it. Or private means nobody can see that location except you. So if you want to do something around your house, but you still want to be able to use it in citizens data, I would recommend obscured. I generally leave it as open and just click done. Now, here's one, the competitive nature in me kind of wants you to, wants to point out something, but we want, I kind of don't want to point it out. This captive cultivated button, 
For example, this flower is cultivated, even though I grew up from a seed, I have to go, I, I'll go ahead and put yes and done. But during city, city nature challenge, by putting that as a yes, I think it winds up not counting as a species seen. Uh, and then projects, if you want to insert it into a project, you can insert it into a project. A lot of the projects I participate in automatically suck them all in, so that's not as important anymore. But then the all important save button afterwards. And what I set up is sort of a default. Let's go here. There's, if you look down this app settings, you see change username, change email, auto complete names. I leave that in there. Automatic upload. Notice that I have that one turned off. Those of us that spend a lot of time out in the field where our cell phone connections are not particularly good, I recommend turning automatic upload off. Otherwise, you can't make an observation until it uploads. And then you might be in a nice spot where there's a whole bunch of things and all of a sudden there's insects moving around that you know you can get. So do turn off automatic upload, but you can do it here in this um, in the settings section. And you can have it, if you show common names, you can have it suggest species um, for the ID and things like that. So go ahead and go back. And if you want to upload it the way I do it, you have to, you just go ahead and hit upload and it'll upload. Oh, it's canceled. Oh, so you can see it's uploading the little green progress bar. You know, if I wasn't talking about this, it would probably take me maybe 30 seconds to go through this process at the most. But uh, so you can see how easy it is to um, make an observation. Alrighty, so here I'll go through. Now we've done it. Um, you can see here it is sharp sheepled, sharp sepled beard tongue. The observation was made four minutes ago, and we'll see how it. We can see if it gets identified later. All right, so I'll get stop this share and go back to the presentation. All right, but hopefully everybody sees the presentation again. So we've gone through the little activity here. You know, you just go ahead and look at these little, remember these little buttons on the bottom of the screen. And I think Android has buttons in the same place. I think, but to add an observation, you hit a, the, a plus button, I think. Oh, I can actually, I think I have the Android phone um, thing here. Notice there's a, to make an observation, you hit the plus sign at the, I think it's at the bottom of the screen in the Android. Um, I keep saying I'm going to borrow an Android phone and make a few observations and figure out how to do this every year, but I never get around to it. But it has all the same kind of information. And you can see here, and I'll make these, if anyone wants a copy of these slides, just let me know and I can post them or send them out. Oops. Now using a computer, um, what you can do is you can, and what I do is like, for example, a, lot of, a number of people know that I've made a lot of observations of moths and insects at TCPP. And what I would do is I'd go in and take a can with a camera and take pictures. And I would do make, make 50 to 100 observations in an evening. And then I would go ahead and process all those pictures using whatever tool you use. I use Lightroom. I can process probably 100 observations in probably 45 minutes or so if it was have a nice little workflow. But you can get those pictures ready and you can just copy them in and you get these little cards that form as you copy them in. It has like species name and the data and all that stuff inside the, the app. Um, one of these days, uh, there's a number of different YouTube videos showing you all those little details. I have yet to do one for using the computer, but one of these days I will do one showing how I use Lightroom to process all these data, all these pictures. But if anyone has trouble using it with your camera, uh, let me know and I can actually walk you through pretty easily, uh, depending on what you're doing and depends on your situation, what your pictures are, and format they're in, you can, it, the advice might be a little bit different. Okay, once you record that observation like that, 
Gulf Coast Pinstemon picture I just took. Anybody in the world who wants to know what I just took a picture of, what I just observed, it's available to everyone in the world. I mean, I made no, put no restrictions on it. And that's one of the nice things. It's an instant uh, notification that data is available everywhere. And for that observation to be used in science though, you need to, it needs to be made a research grade observation. And I've made reference to it a couple of times and here we're gonna talk about what you need. So for search grade observations, you need to have a photo or sound recording. Basically, you think about a museum collection, it means that specimen has been recorded. So that means it's a picture or sound. The date of the observation. And the nice thing if we're using digital cameras and our phones to record sound, as long as our phones have the proper date in them, that'll be recorded for us automatically. And that's usually never a problem. The location, if you have your phone set up and different phones, um, a lot of people have been told not to have the GPS aspect of the phone turned on. Um, in iOS, for example, you can actually tell which apps can get the GPS data or not. Um, and I would recommend if you have an iPhone, that's pretty easy to set up and definitely give uh, iNaturalist the ability, the, the permission to be able to get the GPS information. And you need to have two identifications. Uh, two identifications mean the first one, let's say, for example, let's go back to the one I just made, that Gulf Coast Penstemon. Um, I have, that's one, I, I've made one ID. Now let's say that if Susie Doe from the, uh, Prairie, uh, what's that? The, the goal, there's a chapter just on the west side of Houston that does a lot of plant IDs. If she comes in and agrees with that identification, that becomes a research grade observation. Now, if I put it down as a plant, and then two other, then it needs two other people to come in and make that observation and to be able to identify that observation. Um, as, a, as a rule of thumb, what I will do is if someone comes in and corrects my ID or suggests, you know, corrects it in some way, I will, I usually just go ahead and just remove it, remove my identification, rescind it and leave it until someone else identifies it. Generally, I won't unless I know it's a mistake that I made. Uh, I don't, as soon as someone makes an observation, I, oh, if I agree with that observation, I've done some work and I have verified that that observation is correct. Okay, so that'll make it, okay. Um, so that's the things to make it research grade. Now, if you wanna go play around the website, you know, you can, have, you can create a profile page. This is my profile page look like uh, back in probably 2019 or so. It's changed a little bit. These numbers are all different. Um, if you go and you have your observations, you can have your observations look like this. And I can walk people through being able to identify these things. But here, I made a comment about sort of living through others. You can go through this um, web page, and it's, it's your it's your dashboard. You can see what your friends or people that I've identified things that you've you've had or anything like that. You can see that'll pop up on this page. And you can see these little buttons, the profile, give you that profile, your observations are here. You can actually, it does a little calendar thing where you can look back and say, you know, it'll give you all the observations you made on a particular day. Uh, it'll talk about the IDs you've made if you wanna make IDs in this tab. Um, the list function does not work very well. I experimented with it and they're not working on that part. So it doesn't work very well at all. The journal is kind of like creating blog articles. If you, you can make comments about trips and like Sam Kieschnick, well, make, he, does, he does these little uh, get, iNaturalist get togethers in various parts of the state to gather observations for a particular park or natural area. He'll po he posts journal articles on a regular basis. Some people favorite observations, but there's a picture they like or something like that, and you can get into projects. So there's a lot of little information here. Scott, uh, said, oh, yes. We have a question. 
Sure. From Martha Richardson. Um, she's asking for the city nature challenge. Do we have to join a project or are our observations automatically applied to the challenge? The, the autumn, if, for, if you are within the six county area during the four days, the city nature challenge, every one of your observations will be, be entered into the city nature challenge. You do not have to join, but there's some there's some kind of fun things if you want to join it. Um, in fact, if you go to, let's go ahead and put a plug in and Chris will be happy. There's, um, oh, where the, I, I, I'm, I'm, my, I'm, my mind is skipped. Where is the place we're gonna do the bio blitz on Friday? It's the um, Shore, Shore Acres. It's on the 29th at nine o'clock, Shore Acres Monarch Way Station. Yeah. Or, yes, I think that's what it's called in the, as a project. Yeah, and it's a, it's a project. So yes. it's like Martha will, will probably be there. I'll go, they'll be there, and Chris. So observations you make there will go into that project for that Monarch Way Station, and it'll go into the City Nature Challenge. And if you join um, uh, nature, Texas, nature, Texas Nature, it'll go into that one all automatically. And so you don't really have to ever join projects, but if you wanna join a project, you can sometimes get a little bit extra information. And I will be showing you some pictures of what kind of information you can get upcoming. Oops. Okay, City Nature Challenge. So all this is the big sales pitch to get into the City Nature Challenge. And this is the, the logo they had a couple of years ago. And I, this is, I like this one better than the newer ones. Um, so City Nature Challenge, it started off that San Francisco and Los Angeles, I don't know if you've ever lived in California or around California, those two cities compete with each other. It's kind of like Houston and Dallas compete with each other. Um, but they had a little contest of who could observe the most things. And this is where the City Nature Challenge came up. So it's the Natural History Museum of, of LA County and the California Academy of Sciences, which is in San Francisco, started competing to see who they saw the most, uh, most species in a, in a few days. And it's now become a big thing. Well, see here's now, here's the logo for this year. And this is last year's results. So in the four days, one point, almost 1.3 million observations were made in generally urban areas. Almost 50,000 species were seen by, and almost 55, a little over 55,000 people worldwide participated. And albeit a, few, a, a smaller group of people actually worked on identifications. So the big project, You'll see if you've seen Jaime Gonzalez, he's been promoting, he, he, I'll show you the statistic that he likes to use. But see, um, Houston Galveston was one, one, two, three, four, number, fit, number five in the total number of observations made last year worldwide. Uh, Dallas Fort Worth made a few more observations than we did. And the Washington DC metro area popped up for the first time. They usually were, didn't, they usually did pretty poorly in the past, popped up a lot, but Cape Town, South Africa, there's a, an active group of a half a dozen people that'll make a huge number of observations, but they made 71,000 observations last year. Let's go down and one more level. This is the one that uh, Jaime Gonzalez is really proud of for us. And he uses this statistic a lot. Houston Galveston for North America had the most species seen. Over 3,300 species were seen in Galveston County, uh, between Houston and, Gal Houston and Galveston last year. So six county area. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a very, very, as we know, there's a lot of nature and a lot of wildlife, a lot of plants seen in our area. Uh, the global project where they did um, a little bit here, the global project there was a number of different people living in smaller cities that complained bitterly that they could not participate in the city nature challenge because it was only urban areas. I mean, like it was like a, almost 100 of them last year. And so they did is they opened up a project 
that if you didn't live in an area, you could actually participate in the global project. So this global project is all of the areas that weren't covered by an area like the Houston Galveston, Dallas Fort Worth area, the Austin area. There's a number of areas in Texas. So they were able to, so this number popped up really high. Scott, another question? Sure. Um, are all observations auto put in the challenge or do you have to have research grade? All of them. They can even be casual observations, which, which is what I found out last year. So just making an observation is all you need to do. And I will tell you, I did an experiment last year. I went birding on the Saturday of City Nature Challenge. We had a great day. We had over 102 species, 103 species, something like that. We saw a lot of birds that day. And I converted all of my eBird reports into observations. And they all became, if you upload them that way I did without a picture, they wind up being a casual observation and they counted. So any observation you make that could potentially be verified counts in the City Nature Challenge. Thank so, you. And can you tell us the dates again, please? I, I have a slide coming up in a minute. Okay, here's the Texas one. It's in 16 days. This is the area. So this is the six county area. You know, it's kind of a, a strange shape here. And I wanna show you that this is the one that I, it would be really, really great if we could get more, P, more observations made in Houston Galveston than in Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, you know, every year I think, you know, we have more people than Dallas Fort Worth, but we don't make as many observations. We don't make as many observations. Oops. But we see a lot more stuff. So that's that's always good. And um, I don't know if, if people remember uh, Sam Kieschnick gave a talk to our chapter, was it last June? Made a comment that Jaime Gonzalez was maybe being a little too competitive and kind of a and Sam notes made a comment that well, you know, everybody it, we, we, everybody wins by making observations. So keep in mind that there are people that look at these things, and it's kind of fun. I like kind of competing with you the, with the Dallas Fort Worth area because I know a lot of people in Dallas Fort Worth that are an eye naturalist. So you know the number of participants, and here this last year, and I think it's a lot of us have finally have been pushing this for a while. We finally, this is the first year this has ever happened that we actually had more participants in the City Nature Challenge in Houston, Galveston than Fort, Dallas, Fort Worth area did. And I think this is the one that this has got the, I don't know if you remember, Sam Kiesnick made a comment that the team here did an excellent job with the City Nature Challenge this year. And this is what he was talking about. We got more, we had more people participating than Dallas Fort Worth. It's the first time that happened. Just think about it. Look here, San Antonio and Austin are almost as many observations as, as we do. Um, by the way, here's a little statistic for you. About 10% of all the observations in iNaturalist are may have been made in Texas. There's a lot of very serious iNaturalist people in Texas. Uh, California, albeit, has about the same number of observations, but between, think about it, California and Texas amounts to 20% of all the observations in iNaturalist, because people in those places are very attuned to the nature and wanting to document it, and that's, the re that's one of the bigger reasons for that. So, it uh, shows that people are getting more and more involved. Oh, I did I do, oh, I went backwards here. Okay. Is some of the results. I like this thing, the rare and endangered species number is getting bigger every year. I did not see, I have not seen a similar slide for uh, 2021, but I heard as a rumor that that was closer to 1500 rare and endangered species we're seeing in, uh, for the whole challenge. And here's what you can do. You can see if you go to the project and join the project, you can actually have your name on the board here. 
you see here, I was like number four of the observations and about number five in, in most species, but you can see that. And uh, it's kind of fun to see that. And it's also fun to realize what are the most common, what are the most charismatic and most commonly seen species in the area? And it's really kind of interesting that almost every year, okay, pink ladies, we call them evening primrose. Some of us grew up in the area knowing them as buttercups. They're not buttercups, but this, this is probably the most common, this is one of the most charismatic things that people notice is these you know, evening primrose, but Indian blanket, cardinals, common sliders, large flower pink sorrel, um, which is, a, in, is not a native species. And Southern dewberry is commonly seen. So you can kind of see what people notice. And, but we, it was really kind of interesting to see this group is almost always the, the top, top most observed species in the City Nature Challenge. Okay, how to participate. You go out between uh, April 29th and May 2nd and make an observation. And if you make an observation during that time frame, you have participated. And you know, and I truly appreciate that because that gets that observate that number of observers number up. Okay. And here, where do you need to go? Galveston, Harris, Fort Bend, Brazoria, Chambers, Waller, and Montgomery counties. So any of those counties, and that's the the seven oh, it's a seven county region. I don't know why I keep calling it six. I probably I probably leave out Montgomery County, but um in my mind, but any of those counties in the area. And Montgomery County uh, has the fewest observations. And so keep that in mind that if you wanna fill in places where there are not observations haven't made, that's one to go. Waller doesn't have very many. Uh, Galveston, Harris, Fort Bend, Brazorian Chambers, almost 98% no, 90, of the observations will be in, in those counties. Submit the observation to iNaturalist and you've participated. And that's all you have to do. We've made it easier and easier every year to participate. And it'll automatically be entered in the, in the challenge. And I, you know, uh, Cindy made a point that I made a, I made a huge number of observations of identifications last year. In the last couple of years, I've done that. What I do for the City Nature Challenge is. The people that don't record, they record things as unknowns or as living thing. I go ahead and I go through and identify and put it into a bigger group and I'll go through really quickly. And usually I do about a thousand to fifteen hundred of them over a few days. Um, I wish uh, I, I'm always hoping that people won't do that, so I won't have to do that much. And I can actually spend some more time maybe going a little bit further. But submit your observations between the between the 29th and the 2nd, but you can go all the way to see the official results be posted on May 9th, but you can actually, identifications can occur between May 3rd and May 8th. And I should have had that as a, on the slide here and I forgot to put that on here. Scott, uh, we have another yes. question that goes along with this. Yes. Uh, what if you already have an observation for a species, is that okay? Are duplicates yes. okay, or should we delete them day to day or year to year? No, never delete any observation you made because that's a valid record and it needs to stay there. And if you, you know, I can say, you know, uh, I've seen a lot of things and I've reported, I, I don't know how many brown pelican and laughing gull observations I have, but I bet they're in the hundreds by now. And that's good. That's, that's very valid, they're scientific data points. Don't delete your observations unless you have some reason due to privacy or you made an observation you don't want people to know about. But every observation, every laughing gull actually counts. Um, you know, so keep, the, keep putting them in and don't ever delete them. Okay, is again, Find, find wildlife, find a plant, take a picture of it and share your observation. That's all you have to do to be able to participate in the City Nature Challenge. And actually, and it can be even details like 
evidence of an animal. And I, I they have a tendency not to get to research grade a lot of times, but scat, fur, tracks, shells, carcasses all count. You know, uh, for example, um, I have I had about 30 or 40 observations of shells that I saw along the beach. Those are observations to make as well. They were a living thing and it's evidence of what happened to them. So, you know, don't ignore those things. The more you and I will tell you, the more observations you make, the easier and easier it is to get to find more observations. I know for me, it took a long time to get to a thousand observations, but I got to a thousand and it seemed like the next year I was at 5,000. So it gets easier and easier every, every time you do it. And the more you do it, the easier it is. Okay, I'll go with this again. The City Nature Challenge is four days of making observations. It starts on the Friday, the 29th and ends on Monday, May 2nd. Uh, the following three days after that, the the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday after that are used. You can post the observations and a lot of us will be doing identifications, particularly a lot of people will be looking for the unusual species to make sure they get documented and things like that. Um, you know, I the only time I will make here's a little competitiveness in that if I think it might be something I'm very apt to go ahead and maybe more aggressively identify things during a city nature challenge and hope that it, if it's wrong, hope it won't get corrected until after the scores come in, um, which is maybe slightly cheating, but go ahead and try to identify things. I mean, there you'll find that there's this um, white checkered butterfly that you see in the area. And there's it's either, there's it's common white checkered and I forget what the other common name is. The two of them really can't be distinguished. They overlap in this area. You can only just you can only determine the species by actually dissecting out. And I think looking at mouth parts or reproductive parts. I can't remember which one. Um, but I've seen people go ahead and put IDs they normally wouldn't for that. They instead of just labeling it that common checkered butterfly, they'll go ahead and try to identify it at that point. Uh, you'll probably get corrected at that point for something like that. We have but a couple of more questions. Sure. Um, does the observation stay even if you later delete the photo from your phone? Yes. There, because you what, what happens is okay. Here's a little bit behind what happens is whenever you know you saw that little progress bar when I made that observation, what that was doing is just copying the photo, and that photo was going into a into a big server farm in San Francisco and somewhere in a couple other places. So that, that picture is getting copied there. So you can delete it from your phone. And I will also let you know that early on, iNaturalist did not put those photos into your camera roll, which is an iPhone term. I don't remember what the, the, I, the Android calls it, but now those pictures you take will appear in your camera roll in the pictures on your phone. But Uploading them, you can delete them, it doesn't matter. And one it, last question, have you yes. uploaded sound recordings? Yes, I, I, I did about a half a dozen of them last year and it's really easy. You push that button, record the sound. And if you want to later on, you can actually download that sound and edit out the, the lead in and lead out to make it a little bit smaller. But yeah, you can record sound now. And I that's think that's it for our questions.